Our next speaker is Mark Danielson. <laughs> Mark comes from a background of marine biology and science communication, having worked with humpback whales in Hawaii and Alaska. He's an avid swimmer and a musician. He plays the saxophone like I do. It's cool. Um, and hopes to use his creative interest to connect with people and pursue a career in marine policy or ocean resource management after the program. Um, Mark. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mark is definitely one of the most positive and enthusiastic students that we have in the cohort. Again, he has a spirit that is um, joyful and contagious when he walks in a room, and it's been a real pleasure to experience that this year. I'll also add that I have many spies in the marine conservation world, and I'm told that his attitude and his um, committed work uh, and his committed work ethic that he had when he went to Curacao was really well received and really welcome and he just did a fantastic job while he was on site um, also in Curacao with Carly. Um, oh yeah, you'll want to pull that up. And the title of Mark's presentation is The Wise Use of Wetlands. It's on the bottom, man. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there are a few other things I will not say because he's about to present. His presentation is called The Wise Use of Wetlands, Balancing Tourism and Protections for a Ramsar Site in Curacao. Thank you, Samantha. <laughs> All right, well, just by reading my title, you may notice that my project shares some similar qualities to that of Carly's presentation. Uh, it is different, though, trust me. <laughs> I, too, went to the island of Curacao and worked with the Weight Institute and Ministry officials to develop management plans for marine protected areas. However, we're going to be moving away from a strictly marine point of view now and focusing more on where the land and sea meet in wetlands. Now, you may recall from Carly's presentation that marine resources are very important to the people and to the economy of Curacao. Tourism is no different. It's actually one of the main industries that relies on the sea there. And in fact, tourism is one of the largest and fastest growing industries around the world. It's estimated that one in 10 people have worked in the tourism industry, according to the UN. And if you're wondering who that special someone is in your life that's worked in the tourism industry, it's me. <laughs> yes, before coming to this program, I too worked in the tourism industry, uh, relying on healthy coral reefs and fish uh, to make a living. However, after five years, I decided that I needed to expand my horizons. So I got a haircut and started this program with the intent to use informed science to make policy and management decisions. Now, I was introduced to the Weight Institute and the work that they do with Blue Curacao, or Blue Halo Curacao, which Carly mentioned earlier. And it's exactly the type of work I wanted to get experience in. It's intersecting marine science with policy and management decisions and designating more protected areas, as Carly mentioned, to protect the island's natural resources from over-exploitation has been a priority for the Blue Halo program. And in 2018, the government of Curacao designated a new protected area encompassing a small, uninhabited island off the coast. This island is called Klein Curacao. It's only three square kilometers in area and it's 11 kilometers southeast of the main island Historically, it has been used as a nesting ground for large numbers of seabirds, and it had a lot more vegetation than you see now. Uh, a lot of areas are still remaining barren due to phosphate mining and livestock grazing that's happened over the years. But in the last 20 years, restoration efforts have happened and the vegetation is slowly coming back. But nowadays, uh, is a popular destination for tourists who enjoy the white sandy beaches and sparkling blue waters. They also enjoy a Curacao National Monument in the, in the form of this uninhabited lighthouse. Now, unfortunately, as the popularity of this island grew, so has the threats to the island's ecology due to human impacts. And that's why it was designated as a Ramsar wetland of international importance. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Ramsar Convention, it's an international treaty signed in the city of Ramsar, Iran in 1971 and it fosters international cooperation on the conservation of wetlands around the world. Although classifying that small island seems, as a wetland seems odd due to its barren appearance, uh, it does support brine pools and salt-resistant plants such as the button mangrove, and 
In addition, the coral reefs around the island are classified as wetlands under this treaty as well. So the presence of some of the healthiest reefs in all of Curaçao around the island qualify it as a Ramsar wetland of international importance, as well as the presence of nesting seabirds and endangered green sea turtles. The center philosophy of the Ramsar Convention is the wise use of wetlands, which refers to achieving a balance between protecting the ecological character of an area while also supporting the sustainable development and thereby benefiting society and nature. The wise use of wetlands is what inspired me for my title, and each Ramsar site is required to have a management plan to ensure the wise use so that everyone can enjoy sea turtles and other wildlife that come in contact with the ecosystem. And that's where I come in. Now for my project, I developed a management plan for this new Ramsar site. And the first step was to prepare by reviewing documents provided to me by the literature, or by the Waite Institute and the Curaçaoan government. I also reviewed some work from a previous student in last year's cohort to understand what management strategies worked best in other marine protected areas around the Caribbean. Next, I planned a site visit to Klein Curaçao in order to see the habitats for myself and understand the potential threats. More importantly, this was an opportunity to meet with government officials and stakeholders, and that would prove to be the most critical part of this entire project, because being an outsider who is not familiar with the island or the people, it was important for me to get their perspective on what they thought would be included in the management plan. So that was critical. After that, I revised what I thought I knew about the management plan in order to draft the final product, which would be submitted to the Curaçao Ministries. But I don't have time to redo the entire plan right now because it's 40 pages long. So instead, I wanted to focus on the site visit and the meetings with the official stakeholders. So with that, let's go to Klein Curacao. The only way for me to get there was to use one of the tour operators. So I signed up with the largest one who made the biggest impact. Of course, since I was going in order to observe what sort of unregulated activities they were getting into, I figured it was best if I went uh, disguised as a normal tourist and I went undercover <laughs> and after a two-hour boat ride that left half the boat hanging off the side, we finally arrived at our destination, Klein Curacao. Now, as soon as the island comes into view, you can tell why it's so popular with tourists. The beach is white and sandy, and the waters around it are indeed beautiful, and it's a rather serene escape from the busy island of Curacao. But I was more focusing on the buildings. This complex to the right is what was used by the tour operator that I went with. But there were many other complexes like it, including fishing shacks that were used by the locals. And a lot of these buildings had concrete foundations, solar panels with electricity, and some even had bathrooms with running water. Now keep in mind, all these buildings had not gone through the pro proper permitting process. They were just built there. Um, so that posed a problem right away. But in addition, the presence of bathrooms on a small limestone island like Klein Curacao is a uh, potential source of pollution in the water, as limestone is porous and Although I couldn't tell where the water was going, if it was going into a septic tank, that is also a source of leakage. So that was gonna be one of the problems that I needed to deal with. But from researching the island beforehand, I expected the area to mostly look like this, uh, with brine pools and um, vegetation covering the areas around the brine pools, much like the aerial picture you see before you. Uh, I noticed that there were three small tractors complete with boat trailers on the island, and that also, was a threat to some of the natural ecosystems, especially the nesting seabirds and turtles which nest on the ground and can be hard to see. So, I was assured by the tour operators that they only stick to driving on the beaches and ferrying people back and forth. But unfortunately, the evidence proved otherwise. Uh, this is a picture of the same brine pools that you see in the aerial photograph, although you can easily tell they have the scars of tractor trailers and foot traffic. A couple of other problems stood out. Due to the lack of regulations, the tour operators uh, were engaging in activities that were not exactly beneficial to the wildlife, uh, just to put on a show for the tourists. And this included feeding uh, wildlife. A normal part of the tour was to uh, throw the leftover ham and cheese sandwiches into the ocean in order to gather fish, seabirds, and even sea turtles around uh, the, path, the snorkelers. And the wildlife was so accustomed to this that many wild, many wild birds and fish would just swim right up to you expecting to be fed, like this flamingo uh, that got way too close to me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a juvenile flamingo, and its, fully, it's uh, feathers are normally pale gray like this, but if it's continued to be fed human food, 
it will never develop that telltale pink coloration. However, despite the notable problems, I could tell why the island was popular um, and also why it needed to be protected. There were several definite problems that needed addressing. One was the illegal buildings on the island, as well as the presence of toilets without running water. Uh, and also, we needed to establish rules and regulations for how people interacted with the wildlife so that ecosystems and animals on the island uh, didn't become more threatened and damaged. Of course, enforcement of regulations on a small isolated island would prove to be difficult. So I had to speak with people who knew more about what needed to happen over there. And that brings us to the stakeholder engagement. Now, like Carly, I was able to set up meetings with Curacaoan government officials, uh, representatives from the Co Coast Guard, Harbor Master, the Tourism Board, fishermen, and environmental nonprofits. And like she mentioned, something they all had in common was that they agreed upon that tourism in Klein Curacao had to be controlled in order to protect the area. Now, I wanted to hear from each person that I met with how I could improve the strategies uh, in the management plan that I originally drafted, but also what they wanted to have include, it, included in the management plan. And like I said, that would be some of the most critical feedback that I got during this project. Now, there were some uh, conflicts and arguments on how to deal with some of the issues. For example, the buildings on the island that had not gone through the proper permitting processes. Some wanted them destroyed, but I argued that they be left there to go through the permitting processes and uh, not damage the island further. Now these five management objectives outline the goals of the plan that I developed, and they were revised according to that feedback that I got. Each of the objectives is further expanded upon in the final plan with actions that are needed to accomplish each one. For example, the main action necessary to achieve the first one was establishing the access permit system, and that would be an effective way of controlling what was allowed by the tour operators and what wasn't allowed. So what types of things they were uh, permitted to do. And that was one of the highest priority actions for the excess of the entire plan. Now, there would also be a user fee that would go along with the access permit system, and that would help fund some of the management strategies that were later expanded upon in the plan. And you can see in objective five, that is a main part of the plan as well, because in order to get this park from paper to water, you do need funds. <laughs> in addition, the map, uh, that you see before you outlined the Ramsar area, and that um, was going to be a big part of the outreach and education that was involved in the Ramsar site. Now, the mooring spots for unregulated uh, anchoring are clearly marked here, as well as trails for people to stay on the path. Uh, but this is a type of uh, imagery that I would, I, I would imagine would be helpful for people to know when they're on the island so that they don't step over uh, the trails and step on nesting areas or sensitive plants. Now, altogether, the actions included in the previous five objectives were designed to fulfill the goals of the Ramsar site, of the Ramsar Convention. And in the coming weeks, this plan will be submitted to the ministries in Curacao to be signed and to put into use. Through this project, I gained experience in developing policy and management strategies that utilize science to achieve marine conservation goals. And I also was able to produce a tangible product uh, to be used further in the government of Curacao. And I'd like to thank my capstone committee members for the unending guidance that they've provided during this uh, entire process. I wouldn't have been able to do it without them or without the help from the ministry officials that I met with in Curacao, as well as the site coordinator for the Weight Institute. Um, in addition, I'd like to thank the staff of the M A MAS MBC program, my fellow cohort, cohort, my family, and my partner, Vanessa. Thank you so all very, very much. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. That's a great question. So, when I started this project from the literature review, it was estimated that about 600 tourists per week visited Klein Curacao. And a major part of this uh, management plan I thought was establishing a, a limiting number or carrying capacity for the tourism on the island. However, the time length of this project, 10 weeks, did not really allow for a proper evaluation of the carrying capacity of the island. So I instead wrote it into some of the actions in the management plan that monitoring efforts could include uh, such a carrying capacity study in the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Uh, the most difficult part of drafting this management plan was uh, making sure I was taking into account um, realistic goals that people on Klein Curacao or on Curacao wanted to see happen with the protected area. Um, sometimes I would want to do more than what was realistically possible. Uh, for instance, with the enforcement goals that are outlined in the plan, enforcement can be really tough on this island. Uh, because it's so isolated. So instead of pushing for a lot of um, efforts to patrol or to have rangers on the island, that would be more of a long-term goal, and the short-term goal would be something more realistic, uh, like inspections on the sites and the tour operators through the access permit system. Yes? Do you think there's um, things that you have proposed that would be difficult uh, for, or that people might push back uh, against? at this point, or do you feel like you are pushing essentially on an open door and they're looking for, um, for a, a set of objectives that mm -hmm. have been clearly laid out in your plan? Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to be directed through this project with the Way Institute, who has connections in the government of Curacao, so they were asking for the management plan and, and the objectives, and they kind of outlined uh, what direction they wanted to go, but that being said, Part of the stakeholder engagement I thought was missing was meeting with the tour operators that go to the island. Um, I was directed away from meeting with those tour operators uh, due to the nature of my project. They felt that it would be better if, uh, if this was more handled um, in other ways. So that would be uh, a challenge that I would uh, try to incorporate in a future project that would be similar to this, is uh, really reaching out to to everybody.